Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we will examine some of the challenges that come with contemporary agriculture. Let's dive in and examine what some of those challenges are. There are several environmental issues associated with modern farming practices, and we can examine them through a few different examples. Let's start with biotechnology and GMOs. Modern farmers aren't simply engaged in the primary sector, but dealing with manufacturing, marketing, and even research. Proponents of genetically modified organisms have pointed out that the increased production from genetically modified crops has increased the available food supply while also driving down the cost of food. The crops can be modified to be more nutritious, as well as drought, herbicide, and pest resistant. And while most scientists believe that GM foods are safe, some of the environmental impacts can be associated with negative health impacts. Genetically modified plants that can resist herbicides allow farmers to quickly and easily spray their fields, but have also led to increased use of herbicides as farmers no longer have to be careful about killing their crops. And as countries, particularly peripheral countries, increase their use of herbicides and other agrochemicals, the risk that fertilizers could reduce organic matter in the soil or that any agrochemicals could run off into streams, rivers, and lakes rises. This could lead to polluted drinking water, species extinction, and health problems for the local population. Some countries like the United States, Brazil, and Argentina have large GMO production, while many other countries, particularly in Europe, have restricted the use of GMOs. In fact, genetically modified animals are banned as a food source in EU countries. But if countries focus too much on specific genetically modified strains, there have been concerns about the loss of biodiversity of other plants and that the engineered genes could spread to non-GM plants. And from an economic standpoint, GM crops have benefited larger landowners more than smaller farmers. This is because GM seeds and the accompanying fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, and machinery are expensive. Many smaller farmers have taken on tremendous debt burdens to try and keep up. It's important for you as an AP student to be able to see, understand, and argue the potential benefits or drawbacks associated with topics like genetic modification. Another topic that presents a variety of challenges is aquaculture. Fish harvests have increased dramatically as the population has grown. By the 1970s, fish stocks were quickly depleted and aquaculture arose as an alternative. Aquaculture requires less space and care. They can be grown on land, in tanks, or in containment ponds with nets. As a result, fish farming is a key reason that protein availability per capita has kept pace with population growth. And as of 2008, aquaculture was producing nearly half of all fish and seafood consumed worldwide. But most commercial aquaculture requires large energy and chemical inputs. This includes antibiotics that can fend off diseases and parasites that could spread quickly amongst enclosed fish. Artificial feed is also used to reach market weight faster, but may produce dangerously high levels of organic material in the ocean. Other chemicals can pollute waters and may have negative impacts on the ecosystem by concentrating toxins. The abundant waste that is produced by the fish is equivalent to the sewage of a small city and also contributes to environmental pollution. But as is almost always the case, you must be prepared to discuss both sides. While many chemicals and waste can pollute aquatic ecosystems, shellfish farming can improve water quality 
because the shellfish filter water. As a result of some of these challenges, changes have started to occur in terms of where and how food is produced. There is an increased focus on the sustainability of agriculture. Sustainable agriculture is defined as farming methods that preserve long-term productivity of land and minimize pollution, typically by rotating soil restoring crops with cash crops and reducing inputs of fertilizer and pesticides. But sustainable agriculture requires a delicate balance between the needs of a growing population, minimizing the negative Im environmental impacts of agricultural practices, and providing equitable economic and social opportunities. One movement that developed from this focus on sustainable agriculture is organic farming. Organic farming manages weeds and insects through crop rotation rather than agrochemicals. Organic farms utilize natural fertilizer like manure rather than artificial forms. There tends to be greater crop and animal diversity rather than extensive monocropping. As a result, organic farms use less machines and are more labor intensive thus creating more agricultural jobs. This in turn leads to higher prices for organically grown crops. But since most of the organic food is consumed in the global core, particularly the United States, Canada, Japan, Australia, and Europe, consumers are willing and able to pay the higher prices. This has made organic farming the most rapidly growing and most profitable agricultural sector in the world and has encouraged many commercial producers to switch their production to organic. The lack of chemicals has benefits for both the health of the workers and consumers and can also reduce soil, air, and water pollution. But because of the more limited production, more land may be needed to provide the same amount of food that conventional farming is able to produce. And while wealthier consumers may be willing to pay the higher prices, not all consumers can pay the higher prices and might be unable to buy the fresh food they need, a phenomenon we will examine shortly. There are other agricultural practices that emerged in recent decades due to shifts in consumer demands. Farmers may choose to produce what are known as value-added specialty crops. These are crops or livestock that are produced or processed in a unique way, such that the crop is now more valuable to consumers. Examples include diverse varieties of cheese or ice cream, Jams and jellies that are sold at farmer's markets are more valuable than the raw fruits they came from because of the way the jams and jellies are made. Free-range chickens are produced in a different way, that is, not confined to a cage, that some consumers are willing to pay more for. Coffee and chocolate are also prominent value-added products. Oftentimes, the processing of goods adds considerable value, and much of the revenue goes to those who process the crops rather than those who grow them. The fair trade movement is a global campaign to address this imbalance by paying higher prices and reducing the steps in the supply chain so more income goes directly to the farmers. For farms to be labeled as fair trade, they must be small farms, follow several regulations that promote sustainability, reduce poverty, and avoid the exploitation of independent farmers. There are many fair trade products with the most widely sold being coffee, tea, bananas, and chocolate. But the list also includes honey, wine, nuts, spices, and even flowers and soccer balls can be fair trade certified. The fair trade campaign has successfully pressured retailers like Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts into carrying fair trade coffee, as well as retailers like Whole Foods, Target, Walmart, and Sam's Club that also carry other fair trade products. To discuss the last few 
new agricultural movements, we need to zoom in to a more local scale. Many residents have begun to push for more locally sourced food. There are several reasons that these locavores, as they're called, give for wanting locally grown food. Less fossil fuels are used transporting the food to market, contributing to lower greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, the food is fresher and more flavorful, and many believe that locally sourced food help to preserve traditional cuisine. Also, when consumers buy local, the money stays within the community, and it's possible to have a personal relationship with the producer, the farmer. This is known as Community Supported Agriculture, or CSA. CSA is a direct-to-consumer marketing arrangement in which farmers are guaranteed buyers for their produce at guaranteed prices, and consumers, through prepaid subscriptions, receive fresh food directly from the producer. Another CSA alternative that you might be familiar with is the local farmer's market. There are also restaurants that are labeled as farm-to-table, which support local farmers, again, getting fresher food while more of the profit remains with the farmer due to fewer steps in the supply chain. Urban farming is another local agricultural practice that is gaining support. Urban farming is a more intensive form of agriculture that can be used for subsistence or commercial purposes. For example, vacant lots, abandoned buildings, or even rooftops can be converted into space to grow crops. And this has been incredibly successful, particularly in the developing world. In China, more than 90% of all vegetables that are consumed in cities are grown in cities. In Uganda, 70% of the poultry and 90% of the leafy vegetables are produced through urban agriculture. And some believe that this could be part of the solution to our next topic, food deserts. A food desert is an area characterized by a lack of affordable, fresh, and nutritious food. So you can see why the rise of urban agriculture might address this problem. But food deserts exist in both urban and rural areas. The defining characteristic is the limited access to grocery stores that stock a wide variety of fresh fruits and vegetables. In food deserts, both urban and rural, a lack of public transportation can make it challenging to access larger grocery stores. And in rural areas, local grocery stores that once served small communities have been closed and replaced with larger national chains in regional trading centers. So people have to travel considerably farther to reach areas with nutritious foods. As a result, Lower income residents without their own vehicle tend to rely on local convenience stores or fast food restaurants. So nutrient poor goods like beer and candy might be readily available, but fresh fruits and vegetables may not. In addition, in metropolitan areas, rates of obesity and diabetes increased and the rate of fruit and vegetable consumption decreased with increasing distance from grocery stores. This feeds into the larger issues of food insecurity. Food insecurity occurs when large numbers of people experience long periods of inadequate diets. So residents of food deserts may be food insecure, but they're not the only ones. About 10% of the United States population experiences food insecurity each year which can contribute to inadequate nutrition. While food production has increased and the overall proportion of undernourished has declined, there are still over 1 billion people who suffer from undernourishment despite the fact that we have enough farms to produce more than enough food to adequately feed the world's population. And there are lots of factors that can contribute to food insecurity that can lead to malnutrition. Poverty, 
inadequate distribution systems, and government corruption are broad factors. But more specifically, when arable land is devoted to crops that are not eaten, like timber, rubber, or coffee, this can put a strain on local food supplies. Extreme weather events, natural disasters, and climate change can damage crop production, leading to food insecurity. We've seen this in recent years in France, Haiti, Brazil, Ethiopia, and Indonesia, among other countries as well. In the United States, poverty is a major factor for food insecurity, but so is the expansion of suburban communities, which have encroached on productive farmland. However, 60% of the world's population suffering from prolonged hunger reside in countries affected by war. South Sudan, along with its former country, Sudan, northern Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Myanmar, Yemen, and Afghanistan have all experienced food insecurity driven by conflict. And the impact of food insecurity can be far-reaching as well. Hunger contributes to stunted growth, weaker immune systems, and low weight for children which is associated with increased risk of mortality, as well as lifelong cognitive and physical impacts, which negatively impact the economic opportunities for the individual, but also for the country as a whole. Finally, everything that we have discussed tonight has had economic impacts on how food is produced. Feedlots and aquaculture use space more intensively, reducing costs, but with environmental impacts. Big corporations buy up big plots of productive land to produce food for export, producing cash crops like coffee and tea, while that land could be used to address malnutrition and food insecurity. Urban areas continue to grow, encroaching on farmland that can increase the price of food, contributing to food insecurity. So let's spend the final few minutes of this lecture examining the economic forces that influence food production. Large corporations are able to incorporate GMOs and to buy up larger plots of land, thereby making agricultural productive more economically efficient. You should recall that this is known as economies of scale, or cost advantages that come with a larger scale of operations. In other words, the average cost of production decreases as the farm increases in size. As a result, larger farms have become less diversified as farmers focus on one or two crops in order to maximize profits. So for example, chicken has become the least expensive kind of meat in the United States and Canada because of the mass production driven by consumer and fast food demand but that production is largely coming from a very few, very large farms. And governmental policies promote this through the use of subsidies, which you recall are a government payment that supports a business or market. The largest commercial farms receive the majority of the approximately $20 billion in annual farm subsidies in the United States. And those farms generally produce just one or two crops like corn or soybeans or wheat, which encourages overproduction and discourages diversification. This can contribute to malnutrition for local populations, but also increase the likelihood of environmental problems. In addition, Many smaller farmers choose to produce organic or specialty crops as a result in an attempt to remain profitable. The reality is that many decisions that are made by farmers may be controversial, contribute to the decisions made by other smaller farmers, may lead to food insecurity or malnutrition, and may have tremendous economic repercussions. It is your job as a human geographer to be able to think about these decisions and apply them in a variety of different contexts. That's all for this evening, and I'll see you guys back in class.